this morning's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 9, and Romans 14, verses 1 through 4. Would you hear these words? From 1 Corinthians, Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there are maybe so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And now from Romans 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of one another? Is it before their own Lord that they stand or fall? And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pastor Rockford is not able to be here today to share his sermon due to illness, and so please keep him in your prayers. The message that will be shared was written by Pastor Rockford, and it is an important message as we continue to discern how we live together as one body united in our mission of changing lives that change the world. And so let us pray for the Holy Spirit to take these words and speak through them. And let us pray. O oh God of light and love, give us a spirit of wisdom and insight. We come listening for your spirit of truth to speak to us as we carry out your mission in the world. May the words shared today and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Pastor Rockford tells a story about when he was a child. He says, I was on the driveway with other kids and cousins preparing our tackle box and fishing poles for a jaunt out to Turkey Creek when the strict old Mennonite guest preacher whom Grandma had invited to Sunday dinner came out to warn us about breaking the Sabbath by going fishing. He says, we dismissed the warning and continued to prepare and to scare us into obedience the bald-headed and bearded minister told us an obscure and often ignored biblical story about Elisha the prophet being accosted by some small boys who jeered at him saying, go away, bald head, go away, bald head. And then Elisha cursed them in the name of the Lord and immediately two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. You know, there was a time when keeping the Sabbath was sacred and serious. Sunday avoidance of work of any kind, of, of many pleasures, for most Christians was indisputably mandatory. Now, though, for many, it has moved from the indisputable to the disputable category. 
In today's scriptures, we find a similar argument going on in the churches when the Apostle Paul was coaching them about how to maintain unity and harmony, even with diverse convictions. There were issues about eating meat from the marketplace that had been offered as a sacrifice to some pagan idol and about holy days and women's roles. And of course, the question of whether or not Gentile men had to be circumcised in order to be a bona fide Christian. In fact, Paul himself seems to move that issue back and forth from the disputable to the indisputable category, arguing against it in Acts 15, endorsing it for Timothy in Acts 16, but then absolutely forbidding it for Titus in Galatians 2. There are, of course, indisputable affirmations that are clear in Paul's writings. It is indisputable that there is one God, and idol worship is forbidden. It is indisputable that the core of the gospel is faith in the grace of God revealed in the crucified and risen Jesus as God's chosen agent of salvation and the Lord of love for the whole world. And it is indisputable that sin is real. It is harmful and destructive to persons and groups of persons. Sin is serious and it's to be avoided. So, What then is the healthiest and the most biblical practice for discerning where to draw the line between disputable and indisputable columns? Well, the answer is shared humility. In today's scriptures, we find a clear theology of shared humility in three parts. First, the highest, most valuable, and necessary knowledge claim is not what we know or claim to know, but it is that what we know is that we are known by God. Paul writes, anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by God. God knows us inside and out, knows our errors and our ignorance and our knowledge gaps. God knows what we don't know, even while we don't know what we don't know. To be known by the God whose ways and time are inscrutable and unsearchable is indeed the basis for our humility. Two, God alone is judge and vindicator. We are not. That is not our role. Shared humility is our role. Romans 14, verses 3 and 4, which we just heard, those who eat meat offered to idols must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them to stand. And you may know that great parable uh, of Jesus in Matthew 13 about the weeds and the wheat. The kingdom of God is like a crop of wheat that has been planted But then an enemy sows weeds among the wheat during the night. And when those working the field ask if they should pull up the weeds, they're told to let them grow together so that they don't destroy the good wheat crop. That the sorting out will be done when the harvest comes. We are prohibited from despising or excluding those who have different convictions so that we don't sin and bring destruction to the whole crop and to the whole enterprise, the whole church. And three, shared humility is also called for by our biblical understanding of humanity. That is, by a biblical 
description of a very human reality. And that is that each of us, and even the church together, easily gets accustomed to certain convictions related to experiences that we have and how we connect that experience to our faith. In 1 Corinthians 8-7, we read that not everyone had been able to claim the knowledge that because there is one God, that idols and the meat sacrificed to them are benign. Some had become so accustomed to idols that they still thought of the food they ate as food offered to, to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, would be defiled if they ate it. You see, each of us is shaped by our own experience and how we relate that experience to our faith to create understanding. The cor corollary to that is what Paul writes in Romans 14, 22, that the faith convictions we have we should have our own convictions before God and that we should allow others to have their own convictions before God. And then we're just to let God deal with any perceived contradiction. So here is the way that this comes together in support of shared humility when it comes to discerning what is indisputable and what is disputable, or discerning the best understanding of a disputable matter. And so let's imagine a simple triangle with God at the top point and with two persons or groups of persons at the other two points. When both of those Jesus-following persons or groups practice Christian humility, about what they think and believe, then each is willing to defer to the other, knowing that the other person is both known by God and answerable to God. In humility, we are willing to live and to learn together, even if we think some enemy has planted unwanted seeds among us. In humility, we believe that one, that it is God's place, and not ours to separate the weeds from the wheat. And two, that such weeding can actually destroy the good work of God. So each person or groups of persons that stand to some degree opposed on an issue, they also stand together because each relates faithfully to the one God according to their own conscience. Each is required to love God because in our loving commitment to God in Christ, each of us is fully known by the God of tender love and patience. And Paul makes it clear that God, with magnanimous grace, is able to work both sides of the triangle simultaneously. Each of us is required to refrain from doing the work that belongs to God. We are to let God be the judge and instead lovingly curb our freedom and our rights while we work out our differences. Yes, this is the biblical call to mitigate our individualism and maximize our life together. And no, it is not very popular in our secular and our political culture. And yes, there are many challenges. It is not easy to squelch our sense of disgust about something we consider offensive. It's difficult to tolerate what we perceive as a lack of care in others. We squirm and resist when it feels like what we hold to be authoritative seems to be subverted. We chafe when we feel like loyalty is betrayed or our sense of fairness or equality or liberty or justice is undermined by another's conviction. Nonetheless, shared humility 
to stay together, to build up the church together, to work to concern, to discern what is disputable and indisputable, and to have conversation about the disputables is in fact biblical and theological and doable. You may know the story about how two brothers who lived on adjoining farms fell into conflict. It began with a small misunderstanding and it grew into a major difference. And finally, it exploded into an exchange of bitter words followed by weeks of silence. And one morning, a, a carpenter with a toolbox knocked on the older brother's door. He said, I'm looking for a few days' work. Perhaps you'd have something that I could do. Well, yes, said the older brother. I do have a job for you. Look across the creek at that farm. That's my neighbor. In fact, it's my younger brother. Last week, there was a meadow between us. To spite me, he took his bulldozer to the river levee, and now there is a creek between us. You see that pile of lumber by the barn? I want you to build me a fence, an eight-foot fence, so I won't need to see his place or his face anymore. The carpenter said that he understood the situation. And the older brother had to go to town all day. And when he returned, there was no fence there at all. It was a bridge a bridge that stretched from one side of the creek to the other. And his younger brother was coming toward him, his hand outstretched. And he said to his older brother, you are quite a fellow to build this bridge after all I've said and done. And the two brothers stood at the end of each side of the bridge. And then they met in the middle with a long and hearty embrace. And they turned to see the carpenter hoist his toolbox onto his shoulder. Now wait, stay a few days. I've I've, I've got a lot of other projects for you, said the older brother. I'd love to stay on, said the carpenter. But I have many more bridges to build. Shared humility is the bridge over troubled waters that keeps us connected, keeps us from putting up fences, and leads us to unity and harmony. Let us pray. Holy God, builder of bridges, we thank you for our life together when we find ourselves upset with people who don't see things the way we do, we pray that you would remind us that humility is the answer. Give us the courage to walk humbly with you and with one another. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.